Okay, we now have got time to go to questions. Um, can I just ask, uh, we have a couple of roving mics, so if you could use the mic, uh, that's because we actually do record your questions so that we've got a record of the, um, of the uh, conversation. Also, when you do ask a question, please, if you could uh, just state your name and the organisation uh, that you're from. Um, and I might just to get things, have we got a couple of mics wandering around? Yep, they're coming right now, okay, fantastic. Um, I might just get things uh, kicked off and Luke, I might come to your presentation. What do we need to do now? What's the sort of steps we need to do right now in terms of a vision for reducing that cost of getting rain from, say, uh, Moree down to one of the ports? Um, there's a lot of work going on. It, it probably needs to synthesise into getting a sense of, of what the possibility is around a, a, a commercial build for that sort of a railway. Um, there are other things we can talk about in the West. I was over in the West last week. They've got that issue with the tier three lines. There are ways to resolve those things, I think, in the longer term with market investments. But a lot of the problem is around who owns what, who controls what, and what can I invest in? So at the moment, you've got a situation where the Australian Rail Track Corporation, which is a government owned corporation, sits underneath the transport department in Canberra um, it's funded a little bit to, to kind of do a little bit of planning about rail, not really seriously funded. Um, put an ad in the paper. <laughs> ask, for, ask for approaches. And, but, you know, if you're going to then, you know, get into this game of, oh, well, we need to keep this as an ARTC project because eventually we want to sell ARTC and we'll get a great price from it. That, that's, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, the best thing you could do is simply build a serious railway for the growers right, and for manufacturers and everyone else. After that, if you want to throw in the ARTC network to the buyer or to the builder, that's the steak knives in the deal. Right, it, it's getting the productive freight to drop our freight price and be more competitive overseas. It's not hoping in 10 years' time you'll kind of jerry a kind of a build together that someone will then say, oh, the ARTC is worth buying and get an asset sale. It's not what it's about. So I'll go to the floor. Questions? We've got one question up here. Cheryl from Grain Growers. Um, my question's for you, David. As you know, Grain Growers has long um, had this issue of no Team Australia in market um, on our agenda and it continues to be something we're, we're um, very interested in rectifying. Um, I wondered if you could share today some of your ideas about the nuts and bolts of that going forward. So the funding, working with the trade and getting their buy-in and also in particular working with the trade that might already have a presence in market and are already on their own going down this track. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, the nuts and bolts. Uh, probably easier if I used an example. Um, and the example of uh, what is it, what's one of the key strategic issues for Australia as a competitive advantage uh, that is important, and that is to do with food safety. So the Better Farm IQ program was a quality assurance program that had 76% of all Western Australian growers locked up in it, if you like, voluntarily, and it cost them less than $300 a year for certification. Um, but it was dropped simply because uh, there was, at a time when uh, CBH were supporting it and, it and if growers did not get on the bus, it was going to cost them a dollar a tonne. So CBH withdrew and it's now down to about 45%, I suppose. The point I'm making is that it needs a body to take carriage of it. And I would suggest in that case, as Team Australia presenting as, we have safe food, we will continue to ha have safe food. It's as simple as Grain Trade Australia taking a position to get all marketers around the same table agreeing to exactly the same mandate the, grain, the same grain, uh, the same timelines, so that when it gets to a point in time on the invoice, it is if you are not quality assurance, this is the penalty that we will all pay. And, and give it, I'm not talking one year or two years or whatever, we've got to be able to get it to the point where there is scale enough to ensure that it is uh, very economical that it is a simple, streamlined process such that it is easy to execute. That it, in the hearts and minds and souls of every farmer around Australia, they're able to understand the story about 
This is something that Australia can do that no other country can do for these reasons. And this is the way that you engage. It's not about a private organisation picking it up and running with it. It's about an organisation that sits in the middle that is highly respected that enables uh, them to have the conversation with all of the grain traders at exactly the same level. So those that buy grain. It used to be said that the domestic market on the East Coast was the biggest challenge. I don't think so. I think that they've got the grower declaration or the vendor declaration strategy now, which maybe needs a little bit of meat on it, but it's a very, very good baseline and the feedlot industry were the first ones to pick it up. Why is it that we've got horticulture and uh, pigs and pork and so on that have all adopted this, but grains are lagging behind it? So just as one example, Cheryl, that I think that that's the way that, that you could perhaps go about it. Are there other questions? I'm just wondering if there is a marketer or exporter in the room that might like to comment on that. I, I know we had Andy Crane before, but I think he might have left us. Andy would agree with me if he was yes. here. Yeah. <laughs> um, question John, for you, Neil. You oh, here, sorry, we've got one. Your boss. Richard, thank you. Yeah, I better, I better take this question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Richard Clark, GRDC. Uh, just a question to, for Luke. Um, a lot of the Canadian system is. Uh, revolves around containers. Um, in your thinking about uh, a future grain rail system, uh, is that based on containers and, and does the, the old bulk system that we've all sort of inherited actually have a future in a least cost path to market sense? Um, thanks, Richard. I, I'm not a grain expert, so what I'd say to you is um, whether you've got, and, and I understand the basic concept around boxing uh, for hedging and um, for consignment management and things like that, but some of that will be a response to where the world market's going to go. Um, I'm not privy to how those trends are running. Um, simple economics around rail are that um, um, once you've got scale and density, um, whatever it's on it, whether it's you know, ore, coal going through the hunter, provided there's a lot of it, you're sweating the asset, Rail costs a lot to build, but the marginal cost on rail is very, very low. So as long as you're using it and it's, and it's sweated, um, you're going to end up in a better place. You can't, as we do now, expect to uh, put Australian grains out of something like 19 ports around Australia and then wonder why you have a, a, a port crisis. And you know, you, you've got to, it's, it's the scale of countries with, that have serious rail networks the kind that we would be looking for, which are not Europe, but, but North America, Mexico, um, that give you the scale that then sort of shape for you what the ports are going to look like. And that allows you to invest in the heavy loaders and all of those sort of things. It just gives you a different network for what you're trying to do. So I'd say bulk would still benefit from that just as much as uh, boxed. OK, further questions? Um, Neil, I've got a question for you. Uh, the, we've seen, in the last 10 years, we've seen the uh, number of growers growing grain in Australia decline, um, decline from about 40,000 down to 20,000. You uh, put up some very interesting slides there that showed that, uh, from the analysis you have done, um, that uh, it's the bigger growers that are more profitable, and you gave a whole lot of very good reasons why that is the case. I guess the question is, what do you see the future? Do you see a future with the grains industry with 10,000 grain growers in it? Uh, where, where do you see it going? Uh, thanks, John, uh, for putting the pressure on me on the future of the grains industry in Australia. No worries at all. Um, I think it's fair to say that that, 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 tr that trend has continued over time, and there is obviously going to be a level where that stops, uh, where, that, where that stops yet. The end. I guess the problem is that you don't know. I, I can't tell you that it's going to be 10,000 farmers or 25,000 farmers. I'm, I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> uh, the, what we've seen, though, in the um, in the number of farms, is a considerable hollowing out of medium-sized farms. Um, so what we've seen is large farms taking over medium farms rather than taking over small farms, and that's that is uh, that has a lot to do with the position of the location of small farms. So the smaller farms are generally located um, near large urban centres. Uh, so land values are quite high. 
And so when a grower is looking at expanding their, expanding their, their physical size, they look at the high cost um, dollar per acre kind of values of those um, smaller operators and go, that's too much for my, too rich for my blood and moving to those medium, term, medium sized um, growers instead. Smaller growers also tend to, well, there's some anecdotal evidence that smaller growers are holding on to those lands on urban fringes as their nest eggs for retirement as well. So um, I guess we can see what will come in the next 10 years or so. So, so again, I'll, I'll go to any more questions. We've got a few minutes, but if there aren't more questions, we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit early. I've got one last question to David before we go then. Uh, up in Singapore last year, uh, uh, Richard and I went to the Grains Conference and one of the issues that was raised was uh, what's the determinants of quality and uh, there was a very interesting presentation said that the most important determinant of quality was price, price, price and when we spoke with Greg Harvey who looks up, who's the CEO of um, Interflower, he made the point that there's been a lot of mills open up in Indonesia and also in Malaysia, a lot of new mills. Uh, but it's very much a margin-driven business, uh, and what they're after really is the same quality flour coming out of their mill, but with the cheapest possible input in terms of wheat going in the mill. Is what is the future in terms of going for quality? Should it, would Australian growers should they be spending more to grow a higher quality product, or should they be just going straight for yield and uh, making higher profits through growing a larger volume? Uh, John, I don't think the Austra I don't think there's a clear signal there for the Australian market at all. Uh, I do agree with my limited experience in the trading business is that um, price is certainly important, but I th also think that the gap between the consumer and the farmer is ever narrowing. So this whole and 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 the space around which a miller operates. Uh, so if you can imagine, you've got an exporter, 35 or so exporters out of Australia. Uh, and then you've got importers who may or may not be the miller, uh, and then you've got the manufacturers, whether it be noodles or pan breads and so on. Uh, and they protect that space uh, uh, aggressively, that thou shalt not talk to the consumer. But I think with modern uh, media uh, and social media and so on, I think that gap is narrowing so, so much so that it's not just about price and arbitrage and blending lower value black sea and Russian wheats into higher value Australian wheats. It's about functionality and it's also about food safety. So I certainly wouldn't suggest to Australia that you throw away all of those quality attributes that have taken us billions of dollars worth of uh, growers money to develop, even though it is, it is at a time when it's very difficult for identity preservation to be managed in as much as why do growers persistently uh, try to grow a, a Australian prime hard, for example, in northern New South Wales, uh, when if it is exported, then it's blended in with something else to ensure that the protein range is achieved. Why is it that, a, uh, that a, an, an export contract is made up of maybe five or six lines? It's about when the ship will come and go, protein content, moisture content, unmillable material, hectolitre weight, and maybe one or two others, when in fact what the manufacturer wants to know is a list as long as your arm uh, of how do I actually build this into the how, how do the, how do I build the functionality into what I'm about to make? So it's about it's about the consumers gradually driving this whole question of what is it that I'm eating and where do I want it to come from? So I think that there is a a, uh, a period of um, of flux, I suppose, a bit of a still water for Australia. But I think that once Australia gets over this question about how do we compete with the likes of US Wheat Associates and SIGI and, and Francois Export Cereales, for example, into Middle East and North Africa, then once we get out there and start talking about the functional benefit, the food safety benefit, the support, the technical uh, stuff that not only pre-farm gate supports your consumer, then I think there will come a time when those values are truly realised and we will get over what Greg Harvey is now saying, price, price, price. Can I Luke, you might want to yeah, add just add something yeah. from an infrastructure perspective, not, not an expert grain grower perspective, obviously, but one of the things that's curious is that there's a, there's a constant reference to Australia as a niche provider or a boutique or top-level quality provider. And, um, coming from a freight uh, infrastructure perspective, transport, um, your costs are quite high. So you drop those costs out and, and suddenly you might find that you're not as niche as you thought you were. 
Um, but, but while those costs are unattended to, and they're not attended to at all, um, talked about the government spending patterns now, you'll never see that. So it's sort of self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. that we're, we're very niche because everything's expensive. Yeah. Mm. Okay, last chance for a final question. Richard. Have you got a mic there, by the way? No. It's coming right now, mate. Richard Heath, the University of Sydney. Um, my question's for David. Um, if it's about consistency of quality and supply and also getting the end consumer closer to the producer, why don't we skip the middleman as such altogether and rather than brand Australia, go for brand Mace or brand Suntop or brand, you know, right to the source. Um, so we have varietal um, promotion rather than a, than a country promotion, which is always going to be hard to get that consistency of um, supply and quality out of. It's a good point and there's some great examples of that. Pick the Shoshu market that was that comes out of specific uh, quality barleys and there are a number of other examples. The brand is already out there. I think the market is more sophisticated than that though. It's not just, and mainly because if you look at the Shoshu market, it's specifically about Japan. But if you're going to go brand maize or you're going to go brand AP, uh, you know, prime hard or brand, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a large volume. Um, and as I said in my presentation, I'm talking about the case to value add. Is it about food manufacturing? Is it about, is it about picking up the intrinsic values for which Australia is well known and presenting that to a global market? Answer is yes, but if you look at the structure of every grain trading company now around the world, and I'm happy to be proven otherwise here, but you, it, you used to have a head of trading and you used to have a head of, a head of uh, marketing. Well, marketing now fits underneath trading, so effectively there is no marketing. It's effectively, with the greatest of respect to the traders, it's more about relationships and it's about taking orders and it's about price and about a narrow range of attributes. It's not about all those intrinsic values that I'm sure you're referring to, Richard, that really does have a, have a, a toehold and we've really just got to let it loose on the global um, stage. I feel that um, we've got multi, so much, so Australia is now, apart from CBH, heavily dominated by multinationals uh, with multi-origin sourcing, it's not just about picking up Australian qualities either. It's about picking up uh, a volume and a price and about some basic qualities that enable them to barely get over the line for uh, their consumer market. No one gives away extra value anymore. So I'm sure that you know, there are values in, for example, the, you know, if we're going to talk about the future of white sorghum into the gluten-free markets in the US, for example. Is there massive opportunity there? Does it need its own brand? Potentially, yes. But when you get it out to be about a 15 or a 20 million tonne export, you've got to do something different. Okay. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that concludes this grains section. Thank you for attending. And uh, we've had three excellent speakers. And I'd ask that you join me in thanking David, uh, Luke and Neil. Thank you. Thank you.